that confirmed, what we will do is we will start this second half of our office hour. Perfect, thank you, Rita. All right, so when we look at performance reporting, one of sort of the biggest hurdles a lot of folks face is in accurately reporting their expenditures. So what we're gonna do here is look uh, and as you can see in the screenshot, all of these happen on the pages that are labeled performance report in all capital letters. That is, all of our performance report pages are labeled that way. And these specific ones are the project expenditures. So where as an SAU, you invoice by title, we now need to report on what project specifically spent those funds. And this is important because there are a number of project types that have uh, statutory limitations on them. And as Rita already mentioned, uh, in a previous recording, you got to follow that rank and distribution rules for Title I. So we're reporting out on where these expenses uh, came from. Now, these are your FY24 expenses, your FY24 funds that were spent from the date of substantial approval through 93024. You may also have spent FY23 funds during this time period and FY22 funds, but we're only reporting out on the FY24 funds that were spent from the date of substantial approval through 93024. Another pain point here to keep in mind, your auditors often uh, have you cut off that reporting for fiscal year on June 30th. But for the performance report, we are reporting expenses through 930. So that that second set of three months there, we, we need that as well. As Tyra mentioned, if these have not been invoiced for yet, they need to be done as soon as possible. So one way to sort of check your math and to see if what you have done is correct is to use this page that now appears in the performance board at the very bottom called Project Totals by Grant. So on this page, there's a column that says Expenditure Total. This is populated based on the expenditures that you as the ESCA coordinator have entered onto those performance report pages. I've outlined uh, one box here in green and two in red. That'll make more sense in a minute. But I just want to draw your attention to the fact that this page exists and that we should not be seeing any negative numbers here, because that means you have reported spending more funds than your SAU has received, which is, of course, not possible in grants for me. So this is what you can find on the invoicing side of the system. And what you'll notice here, the green box, that number was accurate on that previous page. The district reported spending $47,318.59 in Title I, and that is in fact exactly how much they've been reimbursed for. However, the numbers they reported on Title II and Title IV do not align. So we know that either there are still invoices that need to be submitted or that they've over-reported their expenses and need to go in and revise those figures. One last thing to note, like I mentioned, we are reporting through September 30th of 2024. So if we go into your district's invoicing system, and even if the numbers match what's reported in the performance report, if we see there isn't an invoice for July, August, and September, and there's funds remaining, that will be a red flag that we'll have to reach out and ask, you know, uh, does the district have any expenses for that three-month period that they also need to report? Rita, I believe, are just going to talk about Title I carryover. This comes becomes very important because you're only allowed to carry over so much in Title I-A every year. So if we're not fully reporting the amounts, you might be taking a waiver that you don't need to take. There's also one other page you can use. It's called Expenditure Summary. It's right there next to the Project Totals by Grant page uh, in your ESCA application. You can use that to also cross-check your work. Just know that uh, boils everything down by function and object code. So it's a lot more granular. And if you were not as specific as you could be in your reporting, you know, you don't have it in the right functional object code, that will show as a as sort of a miscalculation. But project totals by grant will show up by title if you've properly reported exactly how much funds have been reimbursed. All right, good morning, everybody. Um, just wanted to talk about reporting on goals uh, for districts. So the first area that uh, folks are gonna need to go in to do is reporting on the district profile goals. And so there'll be the performance report section, um, 
that we'll need to go into. The goals themselves will be pulled over automatically. So that is no longer something that districts are going to need to do. Um, so all the district needs to do is actually report on the actual outcomes of the goals. Um, we would encourage people to make sure that they reread their goal to see what they said they were going to use as the measurement to make sure that, you know, when they put in the actual outcomes, um, that is what they're referencing. In the event that for some reason, the tool that it was going to measure their goal is not available, um, you know, go ahead and put in what you have for data and then just kind of give us a note as to why it might have differed from what you originally said. Um, <clears throat> in the event of uh, a one school district, you will only have district profile goals to report on and not school level goals. So for um, public schools, um, again, if you're not a one school district, um, you're going to have to report out on your school goals. So again, you'll go into that performance report page uh, for school goals for each school that you have a project for. And again, it'll be the same structure as the district um, goals page where the goal will be pre-populated and then you'll just re be reporting out on actual outcomes. And lastly, when it comes to reporting on goals for private schools, um, on the non-public school reconciliation form page, um, the district is going to have to go in and put in the goals um, as far as the actual outcomes that were put on. Um, it's no longer going to be completed um, on that non-public uh, reconciliation form that has been separated out. And so um, the form is still going to be needed because there are other pieces on there that we still need. Um, and so that will still need to be signed and uploaded um, into the performance report. Okay, great. And so I mentioned this just kind of as a reminder, uh, part of our monthly updates, but I think it's worth again, noting here, right? It's incredibly important for districts that have to follow ranking and distribution in Title I to continue to maintain and follow rank and distribution through the entire course of the grant and the funding of the grant. Um, so I know budget revisions can happen and things like that, but that is always something to note. What, uh, what will happen is part of the consultant checklist that's reviewed as the performance report, there will be an item that says maintaining rank and distribution and the regional program manager will make a note in that consultant checklist that says, hey, I'm noticing um, actually that you need to spend more funds down at this school um, in order to maintain rank and distribution. And just note that it's the expenditures that are being reported that is what is auto-populating the summary page. And I'll show you an example of that. You can actually see um, as a um, as a coordinator, you'll be able to see the summary page for the performance report and take a look after you've reported all your expenditures per school, what does it look like um, for your rank and distribution table. Um, and a regional program manager, if there's anything off, like if your highest poverty school is so far the lowest per pupil amounts being spent, you'll see a comment in the checklist uh, to address that by the time the grant funding is um, uh, has expired or is expiring. So if you take a look at the next slide. So this is an example of that, right? So you have, this is a district that has to maintain uh, rank and distribution for its five PK through six schools. Um, and right now the highest poverty school is actually being served at the lowest amount per pupil at $754. So this is, and you see that variance there that shows you you're actually spending much less at the school that you should be spending more in. In fact, your allocation per pupil amount should be roughly closer to that $1,222 amount versus that $754 amount that's been reported per expenditures, right? You see that allocation per pupil amount versus expenditure per pupil amount. This is one of those situations where a regional program manager would make a comment to say that school will need to be drawn down, those funds will need to be drawn down, and that school will still need to be served with the highest per pupil amounts. 
if if rank and distribution is not maintained by the end, funds can be, may have to be returned, is my understanding. So that is one of those situations you do not want to get into. You should always, as a coordinator, for those that follow Title I rank and distribution, always be mindful of the drawdown amounts for those schools. The other really big thing, well, there's a few big things with Title I in the performance report, but this is one of those that um, Ryan mentioned, right? Title I has a rule um, where you can't carry over more than 15% year to year. Um, that's the simplified version. You can do it once every three years. Um, the idea here is that you're serving your high, you know, your lowest income schools. You're serving your students the year that of the funds that they are awarded, right? You're not hoarding the funds, you're not maintaining them because that means certain students are probably not being served year to year. So it's incredibly more important to draw down Title I every year. This is a situation where it's going to take the expenditures that you're reporting and it's gonna put that in that first green box. So this is where Ryan said, if you're not reporting through 930, you might look like you have a lot more in Title I. You might think you need a waiver, but maybe you don't, maybe you have, your district has spent down Title I. So it is incredibly, incredibly important to have your Title I funds through 930 to understand where you are in that 15th month, about halfway mark of a grant. Um, it'll show you the amount remaining, it'll pull that. It will then calculate the percentage. Here is 14.29%, so no waiver is needed, right? It's only when it's over 15% does the district then can request, yes, we'd like to keep these funds this year, or no, and whatever the amount of excess carryover that's calculated in that uh, second to last column would be returned. Um, and so that is what I should note, is that we've received waivers <laughs> for this waiver, from the federal government waiving this rule, right? Not making districts do it only once every three years, but allowing them to keep Title I. We've had that since we've had the tidings amendments for previous years. However, it could be one of those situations where we stop receiving a waiver, and in which case, if a district has said yes this year, um, and we can't get the waivers, uh, can't get a waiver in future years, you may need to be spending down those funds, otherwise you'll be returning them because you can only keep Title I funds over 15% once every three years. So I just really want to um, take a moment for folks to think through what this means. Be sure you're spending them down. You can, yes, if you have tons of Title I this year, I would say keep it um, because we've had ESER funding and things that are going away. If your district feels really confident that they can spend in future years down, then don't request a waiver. However, if you have $100 left and you're not sure, um, you can always say, no, we don't want the waiver and return whatever small amount might be over that 15% to have more flexibility in future years. This is a local decision. I just wanted to give you options so you understand uh, what's happening on this page um, and why it's important to note, yes, you wanna keep funds or no, you do not. And here the district went above and beyond. We don't need a, an ex explanation when you say no, um, but uh, nice to see uh, folks fill it out completely. So there are a few questions, Rita, that are timely in regards to the content on the slide. I don't know if you've had an opportunity to take a look at them. I can yes. make them, Shelly, because I answered them in the chat. Um, Thank you. Title I tag team is back. So um, Teresa asked about is the carryover, the continuance. So I clarified in the chat that the carryover is after, as Rita mentioned, that first 15 months of the grant after 930 this year for FY24. That is what's called carryover. Um, so in order to use those funds for an additional 12 months just with title one you need to get a waiver from the state of maine and we are only allowed in statute it says we can only give that waiver once every three years um so breast literacy you are exactly right that's a recap of what i just articulated so you got it um and it's not the case with title two or title three title four title five it is just title one and of mm -hmm. course, any money you transferred into Title I. Mm -hmm. 
So again, expenditures must be reported uh, through 93024 for your district to have a very good grasp about the funding that remains in Title I to understand whether you are going to request a waiver, don't need to, um, or don't want to, and will be returning funds. Awesome. Um, so I'm going to go over the Title I A Title One Part A Supplemental Data page, and there's been a couple changes we had to make. So just as a heads up, a general overview, this information is collected for the federal government for something called EDFAX, which is our federal reporting on Title I. Um, so in in this, this section, you're going to report out on both your targeted assistance schools, as well as the targeted assistance programs at any private schools you work at and your school-wide schools. So report a little differently on each. And then you're also going to be reporting out on students and some other staffing information in those schools. Okay, so here you can see in the TAS, the targeted assistance school, this district didn't have any targeted assistance schools, so they didn't put any numbers there. In the SWP column, they reported out their school-wide students, which are all the students in their Title I school-wide programs. And they also didn't have a non-public program. So at the end, you can see the total of those ethnicity groups is 1,258. Then when they report out the number of students served by grade, in that school-wide program, it is, again, the same number, 1,258. It's boxed in green. They are good. If those numbers don't line up, it means that they're missing a student in one of those numbers. So got to make sure those align. So the targeted assistance services received, you're only reporting this for um, targeted assistance programs for because in school-wide programs, all students are Title I. But in the targeted assistance programs, we wanna know specifically how many students got the particular services. So um, you can see typically uh, most districts have the instructional services under reading language arts, math, sometimes science or reading recovery. So you'll plug that in for the public targeted assistance program. And then on the right-hand side, the non-public targeted assistance program. This part uh, can be a little tricky, so uh, listen up for, for this piece. So tracking staff who are paid with Title Ones, we have shifted this around to try to make it less confusing. So it's a little bit different this year from last year. Um, we are tracking the FTE, so the full-time equivalent staff that Title I pays for. There's an example on the page as well that goes through if you have a bunch of part-time staff and it equals a full-time position at the end then you'll write 1.0 1, 1 FTE. So again, we're, we're marking the FTE, not the number of staff. So um, you want to, if they work 40 hours, then it would be one. But if they only work 35, it would just be a portion. So we just want to mark um, full-time staff here. And then this one is this one's a little different. So we are tracking here certification. The first uh, boxes are, f well, you can see, first of all, there's in the left-hand column, it's for target assistance school. In the right-hand column, it's for school-wide schools. So we're looking at the number of either Title I staff in the targeted assistance program or all the staff in the school-wide program. So the first couple boxes are ed techs, how many of them are certified, uh, or how many are, are paid with Title I funds in the targeted assistance, or in the school-wide, all of them are Title I, so how many are there in the whole school? And then out of those staff members, how many are meeting certification requirements? The next couple boxes are about teachers. So how many teachers again, in targeted assistance, how many um, Title I teachers specifically, and then how many of them meet certification requirements in the school-wide section, all of your teachers in the school, the Title I school, how many are there, and how many are meeting the certification requirements. 
So a lot of information. Feel free to reach out to your regional program manager if you have further questions. Hopefully this, this was a little bit helpful. Um, Jess will answer some, yeah, we love Title I PR stuff because it is crazy confusing and everybody's got questions, Jess, so if you can take a look and answer some of the ones. This, there are uh, four districts that this matters for, this Title I Part D supplemental data page, and it looks much different than a Title I Part A page. Um, so I'm not going to belabor this just because I know for most folks this is not applicable. Just understanding that these are students living in residential facilities adjudicated by the courts. Um, what's really important for the federal government and for the state of Maine is to understand how they are doing because they are vulnerable student populations who live in facilities, um, at least partially some part of the year or are at the hands right of a local residential facility or Long Creek, the Correctional Juvenile Detention Center. So um, we had uh, trainings in May where I went over the new data point. Otherwise, every other data point on the Title I Part D page is the same as previous years. Um, you can reach out to your regional program manager and CC me, um, and we can make sure to help you if there's anything um, that you're not sure about when it comes to the supplemental data page, right? It's about transition services, academic vocational outcomes, pre and post test results. So very different from Title I Part A. Um, I can send those slides, but just note here that we have a guidance page on our website, and I have these, I have the slide deck and the video recording from that Title I Part D training that we held in May. I think actually every district was there that this applies to. So again, um, reach out if you need help with this um, and obviously take a look at resources. All right, Travis isn't able to be with us today, but I can take this slide for him. So the Title IV Part A program also has a supplemental data page within the ESCA performance report that each SAU must complete, regardless of its Title IV Part A funding or transfer status. The purpose of this page is to gauge to the extent to which the SAU has made measurable progress in relation to its Title IV Part A funded programs and activities during the reporting period. So to do this, the SAU will select from the drop-down menu for each of the three Title IV Part A content areas to indicate the level of measurable progress it has achieved in relation to its Title IV Part A work under that particular content area. Of course, if your SEU has not budgeted any Title IV funds under a particular content area, through the transfers or otherwise, you would select NA from that drop-down menu and also type NA in the comment box for that content area. For SEUs that have budgeted Title IV Part A funds under one or more of the three content areas for the program, the expectation is to indicate the level of progress made in achieving goals for that content area, and then to provide specifics around the level selected in the comment box. So for example, if you indicated your SAU made some measurable progress for safe and healthy students, the comment for that selection might be something like, our annual school climate survey showed a 20% increase in the number of students feeling safe and engaged in school, which fell short of our 30% improvement goal. So they've made some progress, just not all the progress they were hoping for. Overall, the comment should provide or offer an explanation as to the SAU's level of progress for each of the Title IV content areas. And we know that some of our public schools have non-publics within their boundary lines, so we wanted to highlight some information associated with ESEA equitable services. There is a reconciliation form embedded in the Grants for Me page, and you will notice that the Grants for Me page has a new look with some additional questions. So again, you can find the reconciliation form embedded on the Grants for Me page, and this will be in the non-public project. It will ask for outcomes of each goal, which are inputted from the FY24 application. So very similar to what the school pages look like, you will see that from the application, the goal will be pulled in a gray box, and then you'll have an area in which to identify how that goal has been met or uh, any identifying information associated with that goal. The table on the reconciliation form must report unspent equitable service balances as of September 30th. So again, it's really critical to be sure that all of your invoicing through September 30th 
is comprehensive as well and includes your non-public equitable services. Equitable services should be provided during the initial period of allowability. If the non-public school official can explain and document in consultation with the public school why funds were not fully leveraged during the initial period of availability and or what specific needs still exist that cannot be met with the current year equitable service funding, this might result in a circumstance that may provide carryover funds and open up a discussion in regards to carryover of equitable services. However, on the form, you will see that there's two very specific uh, circumstances that must be justified by the non-public school official. So we encourage you to download that form, but also visit that page and engage in conversation with your non-public school officials. All right, and then just to kind of wrap up this part, um, looking at the FY22 closeout. Um, so this is also going to be need, uh, need to be done in order to have your FY24 performance report approved. So that 22 closeout, uh, as we kind of mentioned earlier, um, all those funds need to be reported as expended or as many as, um, you know, your district has actually spent out and make sure that on that uh, last um, summary page, the project totals by grant matches up with the invoicing side. So you can see um, these are the funds that have been expended. This is what you've reported as being expended. Um, once we see that those kind of match up and align, we can get that kind of closed out for you. And then that'll get uh, checked off on the FY24 consultant checklist. Um, just remember for the 22 closeout, even if you've already spent all of your funds um, and it's been um, already reapproved, you know, you're still going to need to go in and start a new revision and submit it, even if there's no changes, because we have to be able to click that closeout button. So if you've already submitted all of your um, updated budget numbers um, and expenditures um, and your invoicing is all done um, and we've approved it because there was you know, just some budget changes that needed to be done in order for that to take place, you still have to submit a new revision so we can actually click the closeout button. So again, we wanted to be sure that we were focusing on performance reports for FY24, which we've done. We'll have resources on our website, but our colleagues within the department also offers a wealth of professional development, just like we do as a team. So we always encourage you to visit the department's professional development calendar to determine what might be some needs for you and your staff. Again, want to be sure that you folks have the regional program managers or RPMs contact information for the area in which your district resides. And we know that the Maine Department of Education is on a number of social media platforms and wanted to provide you with that information here. What we are going to do is we're going to stop sharing your screen. Many of the questions in the chat bot chat 